Okay, so um, maybe just a quick on, on background. Um, I started doing community currency work about uh, 10 years ago in Kenya, and I kind of got into the field of it maybe about 20 years. And uh, it, was, it was this sort of um, kind of grassroots kind of movement around the US and Europe, um, things called mutual credit back then. Um, and a lot of it was spurred by Bernard Leotard, who wrote this book, The Power of Money. And, um, and there was a long history kind of before that as well, um, where, you know, municipalities and small groups were trying to create their own currency systems. And uh, there was uh, there was one in in Germany, uh, actually in Austria, called the the Swiss the Weir. I uh, know, sorry, that that was the Wargel in in Austria, and uh, it had all these properties of um, enabling a community that was undergoing a huge depression to connect with each other. And and so what they did was they issued this little voucher, and it was backed by um, local like municipal services, and you can pay your taxes with it. And so they just basically made a currency at a time when there was no currency to be found or there was, you know, a huge depression going on. And uh, they created a, a stamps on it. And those little stamps, you had to renew it like every week. Um, and you had to basically buy these little stamps to renew it uh, that you would stick on the back. And so basically it had kind of like a, a negative interest rate, if you will, like it, it cost money to keep it moving around. And they reported this sort of like 3x or 5x, you know, the, the local circulation of the economy within just a few months. And it was this great example. And, and uh, I mean, this is way, way back when this is like a World War II story. And, uh, and when the governments kind of came back online, they outlawed this, this, this idea. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, there's been lots of examples of countries and municipalities or, you know, small groups creating their own currencies and uh, trying to make them thrive and then sort of national currencies coming in and saying, or, you know, national governments coming in and saying, no, you can't do that. Um, and so there was this res resurgence in like the 80s and 90s of these types of groups that came around and said, well, you know, can we at least create some sort of barter credits? You know, what is the, is there any like legal framework left for communities to actually be empowered this way and take, take uh, kind of charge of their own Kind of economic well-being um, and what would that look like and so there was this resurgence around in, in uh, permaculture groups and um, something called let's came about uh, local exchange trading systems and uh, and many many versions of that eventually it, it branched onto computer systems um, you know old kind of sql databases and drupal apps there's one called community forge um, in switzerland that's that's still around and it's a little drupal app where you can create your own currency and then sort of like more commercial businesses got into it. There's one in, uh, in uh, where is it, Amsterdam or Utrecht um, called Stro um, that started doing a, a, a pretty professional version of, of sort of banking software that could have multiple currencies inside of it. And, and then, you know, there was this whole birth of things like uh, mileage plus miles and reward tokens and loyalty credits. And, and then, <clears throat> then we had Bitcoin. Um, and so there was this huge kind of, you know, if you, if you were into this movement back then, and then when, you know, Bitcoin came about, uh, there was a lot of people that were doing this kind of work. They were sort of cringing. They were like, oh, no, <clears throat> because, you know, here was a, a, another example of sort of like gold mining where it's like, you know, five people own the gold mine. <clears throat> they get to mint all the currency. Anyone who else wants some after that, it, it costs more and more and more for them to do so. And so, you know, those people who got in first and minted those coins, you know, got a lot of money. And then everyone said, oh, well, we can do this too. And so you got into the ICO world where everyone was creating their Tron coins and you weren't really sure what they were good for. Um, and so <clears throat> if, you know, if we kind of take this narrative of like, okay, you know, there was these first, you know, there was people trading cowrie shells and there was people trading salts and then, you know, uh, national governments and, you know, kingdoms forming and all different types of, you know, debt instruments and things like that being created and then this sort of bloom of financial industry and then <clears throat> the technology to create currency is getting simpler and simpler and simpler until what we have uh today is a, a, you know public ledgers where anyone can create tokens and it's as easy as you know five seconds anyone on this chat anyone in the world can go and just you know mint a token on on ethereum for instance um, we're on a side chain of Ethereum. What we use is called XDAI right now, just because it's fast and free. But so anyone could make, make their own token on there. Um, <clears throat> and so 
it's a really interesting situation. And when I first started doing this work in Kenya, um, we were printing little pieces of paper as our currencies, and they would, we'd have graduate students monitoring how fast they circulated um, in communities by by uh, trying to track with little logbooks uh, um, their serial numbers, and. <clears throat> one little voucher that was had a 20 written on it which is like 20 shillings is about 20 us cents um was circulating about twice a day and it was you know over a year they said it was a roughly something like 700 meals uh, being sort of created that were not being eaten eaten before because of that one little piece of paper um and so there was this idea that there was a lot of goods and services that could be traded in these communities here in Kenya that um, simply wasn't being traded, like markets were not as efficient as they could be. There was not enough liquidity. There's lots of goods and services on offer, lots of demand, but there was nothing to meet them, no medium of exchange. So the idea was, can we use you know, this, these ideas from the, from the past and, and, and present around kind of mutual credit systems and could we issue a credit into a community and, and get them to really develop the rules and, and own it um, as much as they could. Um, although, it was, you know, uh, being able to print these currencies now was was a big problem. And then lots of other problems. So we did this printing for about like eight years, um, you know, different communities all over Kenya creating their currencies. We would, you know, get people with uh, suitcases to bring uh, printed vouchers, security printed vouchers from Germany um, to do this. And, and it was a, you know, a, a serious process dealing with all of that, but it was really interesting and it was really lovely to see communities um, taking care of each other in a different way than they had before. And uh, and so, you know, we did a lot of survey work and, you know, we had about 2000 businesses at one point that were saying that you know, we did a survey with and it was like half of them would say it was for financial reasons they were using it because it was more circulation, more turnover in their business, more customers. And then the other half, it was just a, uh, like a, a community thing. It was it was basically like, uh, I think uh, they would describe it as like a way to identify, a way to have a positive identity because they had such a negative identity because mostly we're working in slums, informal settlements. Um, and so this is a positive way to belong and, and take care of each other um, versus the fight for national currency constantly. Um, and, and, you know, th there's huge, huge volatility in these markets here where I mean, even from, you know, paycheck on a Friday for a casual labor to Wednesday, all of a sudden there's no more money in the system by Wednesday again, you know, and, and, and so that sort of weekly cycles, then seasonal cycles where it's, it's, it's really, you know, like number of meals people are eating is literally going up and down with the season. You know, it's, it's really intense, the, the volatility here. Um, <clears throat> not to mention how it is today. So <laughs> we're in a very different situation right now. So there's, there these ideas of community currency you know they they were fundamentally just effective in communities that really lacked a medium of exchange and in a way that i would never see happening in the us i mean in the past anyways and uh and 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 not in europe either they were sort of like fads there they were sort of like a fun social thing like get together but it wasn't about like feeding people or you know sending your kid to school or you know everything from paying church tithings to, you know, everywhere that money goes and sort of facilitates community, um, you could use essentially a little voucher, right? So how do you, there's a lot of problems with that, right? We can't print those uh, for everybody. And how does that work in different communities? How many are they printing? And how do they establish relative value with each other? Um, and how do you create sort of membranes or connection to the rest of the market then you know because it's not about isolation it's about you know sort of safety and collateral and and so um in it was i think end of 2018 i got in touch with the guys who were doing these bonding curves at bancor in in israel and um and uh al herzog had worked on this bancor protocol this open source uh protocol that uh, basically has two equations in it um, one is a pricing equation that basically says that your exchange price for your token, that your community currency, um, is equal to your reserve over your supply of those tokens times uh, all times a leverage factor. And so the idea is to say that the community is backing these local currencies with their goods and services. That's the fundamental thing. But then there was this other idea of saying, well, can we also have, I mean, we have local collateral in a way in the tomatoes and the chapatis and the hair salons. Can we also have some collateral and some kind of reserve? 
Now that reserve could be anything. In, in, in the case with these, these smart contracts, it could be any ERC-20 token. Um, and so the idea, so when we first started this, this work in, in Kenya with, with grassroots economics and, and, and using, using blockchain, we were using um, and still are sort of a, just a virtual reserve. And the whole idea of that virtual reserve, it wasn't BNT, it wasn't any sort of um, you know, market connected currency, it was just another virtual currency. The idea in that case was just to say, well, that is going to be the currency that we will airdrop basically into the reserves of all these communities around Kenya. And they will all create a credit supply of tokens relative to that reserve. And, and that gives them exchangeability with each other, right? So every that, that's how we first operated with about uh, 11 currencies in Kenya here uh, just this last year. And so every currency in Kenya got you know, a, basically an equal amount of this reserve. They had, we created an equal amount of tokens. So it, to give you an idea, um, you know, in terms of just the math behind it. So if we have a million tokens as reserve, that would be like $10,000. So I, maybe I'll back up a little bit and talk about the contracts. Um, so it's not that complicated to understand. And I, I don't know, what, you know, how much background there is on contracts here, but the, the idea is that you've got this contract, let's call it the converter. And that holds two things. It holds some reserve. So that could be some ETH. It could be, I mean, it could be, I mean, right now it's anything ERC-20, but it could be a, a tether. It could be, right now we're using a DAI. Um, <clears throat> it could be a virtual token, like we were just saying. Um, but so for instance, let's say I've got, um, let's say I've got a hundred DAI in there, in that reserve for this community. And this community is the one that's basically owning this contract. Um, which can be permissionless, but basically the, the, the community currency now, the supply of these tokens is basically shares of that reserve. And so if I have 100 DAI in there and I create 400 tokens and I have this leverage factor of four up in the numerator there of, of my pricing equation, so right, price is leverage times this reserve over supply. And if my leverage factor is four, then in this case, I have four times 100 divided by 400, which would be one, right? So basically what we've said is, we're gonna create 400 credits and we're gonna call them all equal in value to the reserve, right? That, that's what you would call like a spot price if you're talking about shares, right? So you have an asset, which could be a house. In this case, it's whatever our reserve is, which could be any token. And we say, let's create a bunch of shares for that token. Great. So what we've done, so instead of, you know, going back, you know, a few years where we just had pieces of paper, they, these were backed by the goods and services of the users only with no real on-chain collateral, no asset that you could count. I mean, you can't really go in and count the tomatoes. So the idea was to say, well, <clears throat> let's do that like we did in the past. It's still backed by the goods and services of the community, but let's also put a collateral in there, okay? That collateral in our case in the past was just another virtual token, but it gave those currencies relative value to the next community, right? So if I wanna trade with the next community, essentially what I do is I take my shares, let's say they're called will shares in this case, and I burn my will shares, and I pull out some of that reserve. And what happens is, is that that actually reduces my exchange value. And then I take some of that reserve and I put it into the contract of my, my neighbor who I'm buying from. Let's say it's another, another village. Let's say they're gym tokens. And I put my reserve in there. I'm adding to the asset. I'm adding to that liquidity pool of gym over there. And I'm minting some gyms. And in the end, Jim gets some of his gyms. And that's, that's basically how it works. Each, each member in the community here, they're using a feature smartphone, I mean, a, a feature phone, like a Nokia button phone. And it, there's this little menu here and it says send. It says, uh, you know, press one to send. Then it says, put the phone number of who you're sending to. Then it says, put the password in. We take that information. We're sitting there on the telecom waiting for these, these to happen. We push all that to the blockchain. Right? And we provide back a receipt that is an SMS that goes to both parties. And all of that is just happening you know, without them really, you know, they don't have to convert the tokens, it's just done automatically. And every individual there has an opportunity to basically say that they're in a certain community and they're able to change that community. And that community basically specifies what token they're using. Right, That's their like home token. So they always convert back to their home token. So it's not like we have a million currencies in everyone's wallet everyone decides what is their home currency. And you could, I mean, you could make this in any way you like. You could have five different home currencies or whatnot. We're just trying to make it basically easy enough to use for a woman selling vegetables on the side of the road. And so right now we've got, you know, about a thousand transactions a day among 
about 12,000 users. Um, and uh, they're trading their basic needs every single day using the blockchain, um, using their own tokens. And, and right now they're backed by this virtual token. In the next sort of week uh, to month, we want to replace that uh, reserve token with XDAI. And that'll be an avenue in which Red Cross can start supporting, like seeding some of these companies, or not companies, but the, 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 mostly they're cooperative businesses within communities that are creating these things. So it's the actual creator of them is generally a group of 25 women that is uh, a savings and loan group. So what they do is, you know, every week they're, they're putting some money into a, a little metal box usually, and they've got little, a little uh, ledger, like a, a physical ledger that they're keeping track of that. Um, and so what's going on now is that they have also this digital vaults that they can put uh, their tokens into. And we also just airdrop into these communities. So we work with the chief and the elders. Everybody's, you know, got most everyone's got a mobile phone or they've got a SIM card. So everyone gets 400 of these to begin with. Uh, the chamas or these these savings groups get an extra 10,000 to begin with. So that's their, which is, okay, so 400 of these tokens would be like $4, which is like a meal for five people in a day. So it's like a, a household feeding itself in a day, just about. Um, and 10,000 would be like a uh, hundred dollars. And uh, which is, you know, that, that would be, you know, the income of five people in a month, uh, depending on where you are. Um, so they start with that sort of seed capital. Um, they've got their vouchers attached to that. These, these, we also call them community inclusion currencies. These days CIC is, has been the term that the Red Cross has adopted in, in sort of rolling these things out. Um, <clears throat> originally we were looking at using them in refugee camps and then, um, and then, you know, coronavirus hit and we're basically using them right now to target, you know, basically how to give aid effectively. So the, the intention behind them is still the same. It's, you know, to build resilient local economies and, and enable people to trade when they don't have enough national currency. Um, but it also, there's also this effect with Red Cross where we can say, okay, well, how do we intelligently seed those communities? Because it's not just about, you know, uh, taking a bunch of random people in a village and getting them to trade more with each other. That's part of it. But, but there's also just this huge, huge need for, you know, basic needs. So, I mean, right now it's soap and water. I mean, people barely have enough water to drink, let alone like wash their hands or maintain hygiene in any way, like especially in the informal settlements is really bad right now. There's no way to really contain or quarantine those areas. And so we're looking at, you know, huge, huge um, problems in the next you know, few weeks. Um, and things are already getting really bad. We've got locusts in the country, you know, food insecurity is horrible. So that's one target right now. Another one is how to use these credits to support you know, a million people that have no jobs right now to sort of boost the food security of the area. How do we, how do we get all these, I mean, the industries are all shut down now. There was, you know, Kenya was exporting $5 billion of food to Europe. So can we turn that back around and start feeding the country? Because they get something like, a, you know, hundreds, hundreds of thousands of dollars of food aid every year. And, and that's been going up and up and up. And right now, you know, the question is, is that, is that even possible? Um, so what's going to happen in the next? Uh, but I, I think I've I've probably getting pretty close to my time, and I think maybe uh, it's a good yeah, time. Yeah, we still have like ten minutes for okay. the talk. Already okay, okay. Well, maybe I'll, I'll get a little bit into what we're doing now. So um, the basic uh, smart contracts we're using are are still the the latest of the the Bancor protocol, um, which is you know it's been through a lot of auditing process and and saves us a lot of time in terms of you know having to build some of this stuff from scratch. Um, although I know a lot of other organizations like Aragon that are looking at bonding curves, and um, we're working also with uh, Block Science at the University of Vienna that is helping with doing agent-based modeling and doing the analytics around um, augmenting these bonding curves in different ways. Um, to, to basically, you know, limit volatility. So when I say that we're using a leverage of four right now, right, so that, what does that mean? Well, it means that there's a certain volatility to the shape of that bonding curve based on what are the nominal transactions on that curve. So, you know, if, if I've got uh, $100 as backing and I've created 400 tokens, but my normal transaction is something like $70, I'm going to have huge amounts of volatility almost no matter what my leverage is. I mean, you know, so in that case it was four, but uh, so if I had a leverage of 10X, 
of my credit that's being issued, you know, with a, a collateral of 10%, we'd have a, a lot more volatility. So there's a lot of just um, modeling around the communities we're working in, with to basically understand what is the sort of uh, liquidity risk and volatility risks associated with them. So far, like the, the whole point of the, the bonding curve in a way is to produce a market such that as the reserve starts to drop out and the price starts to drop, as people are cashing this out, that it is it is lucrative it's it's and meaningful for people to also buy back in, right? So that basically that, you know, as the price drops, it, for one shilling now, let's say I can get two of these vouchers. And as long as the community is still locally backing them, essentially all that's happening is, is that your your credit space, your your collateral is is shrinking and growing. So, I mean, that could happen with, tomatoes that are also backing the voucher. It could also happen like, let's say a school collapses um, and needs to be rebuilt over time. So these are sort of natural things that happen in currencies. And I, I know that, you know, often when I, when I talk about these things, people think a lot about the fear associated with sort of fractional reserve banking. And what I like about what we're doing is that it's very honest fractional reserve banking. In other words, you, you can never pull out more uh, uh, currency than you've than the reserve you've put in, in other words. So the way it works on the bonding curve is like, if, I've, if I'm cashing out my first token of that 400 that I created, well, I'm gonna get a price of about one to, to whatever the reserve is. So let's say it was dollars as, as X die. And then the second token I'm, I'm gonna cash out, I'm gonna get like, uh, you know, uh, 0 0.999, something like this. And then the next token I get, you know, 0 0.97. And so it's almost like, you know, as I'm pulling out the reserve, my share price is starting to drop. It's like you're pulling wood out of the house and whoever holds shares of this property or something, you know, their their share price is going down and, and vice versa is also the same. If I'm building up that house, I'm adding back to it. So it's a way of, and, I, and I'm not really an advocate of using XDAI or, or DAI as a reserve or the US dollar. Um, it's just something that people trust right now that we can use. And, and so there's a whole, um, really exciting path forward around deciding what those reserves can be in terms of like what's in the die. What? Why is it just Ethereum? Well, you know, die is doing a lot of these multi-collateral dies, and there's other projects like you know Open Libra, for instance, that are um, and, and Celo that are doing really interesting stuff on on creating reserve spaces and state different types of stable reserves that could be conglomerates of uh, baskets of different types of indexes, for instance, and. Um, things like that. So I think that's a really exciting space. It's just, it's meaningful us, for us to connect it to fiat right now as a reserve because that's what everyone knows. And that's the, that's, that's sort of our unit of account in Kenya. Everyone knows the price of a, of a, of a spoon, you know, or they know the price of, you know, one kg of unga in the denomination of shillings right now. So it makes sense to use essentially a token that we can connect to shillings, right? So at least the US dollar to shilling rate is pretty stable right now. So, that, but this is a big question with, with coronavirus and all this stuff going on. So the next, there's a next big step of saying, well, what should those reserves be? That's my daughter in the background. Um, and then getting national governments involved as well. I mean, it could be that next version of reserves are central banking, digital central banking notes. Um, IMF really is, is uh, has been kind of promoting that idea for, for a while now. Um, what else is going on? Um, you know, for the, the banker contracts themselves, um, we have a little open source sort of version of them where it kind of steps you through the deployment process, which I think, you know, if someone's used some of the Aragon stuff, I think maybe you would, it would be pretty familiar to you. But the idea that you're creating this contract that has some reserve, you're minting some tokens, there's this bonding curve that attaches the two together. And I, I really like the idea of people starting to understand these and create interfaces for them. I mean, our interface, we have no web interface at all. It's just USSD, like feature phones, and a little command line interface. Um, and so that's a big space that that I think there's a lot of organizations looking at how do we build interfaces for the next generation of credit systems, and which is a one way to describe all this stuff. It's it's the difference between sort of a reserve system and a credit system. A credit system is about you know trust in your community. It's about IOUs, and it probably should not be run by for-profit banks. Um, and, and so if we can decentralize that system and allow any group in the world to create credit in a de-risked way, right, such that there's collateral. And, you know, I don't want to diss all the currencies that have been out there, like Bitcoin and whatnot. But the, the idea that, you know, we can't just have 
a, a million totally separate currencies and expect there to be meaningful markets between them without some sort of underlying protocols. And I think it's really interesting and, and important to get through our heads is if we want to create credit spaces and we want to link them together, we need basically some kind of like DNS like system, some sort of indexes that basically, um, you know, if, if Jim is going to create his token, well, where does he register that token? Yes. Okay. Let's say he connected it with this reserve. Well, that makes it compatible with this set of currencies within these this sort of standard space. So if I want to connect my currency as my municipality to the next one, well, they better have some similar standards. They better have some similar underlying protocols. And if we want Red Cross to use these types of systems, of course, they've got to have a lot of ethical standards and, and you know, risk and liability type standards uh, associated with them. And so this, this idea of, you know, the a community of currency, this network of currencies, um, which are essentially credit systems with this uh, you know, potential sort of like mountain uh, range of reserves that sort of connect them all together, right? So there can be lots of disconnected reserves. Those reserves can be connected through relays or, or, or secondary markets um, that connect them. And so that landscape of connected credit systems that are attached to different reserves, like, you know, we could have a Binance, uh, you know, BNC reserve token in Uganda, for instance. That was actually one of the the we were talking with them, I don't know, about a year ago about they wanted to support projects in Uganda. We said, okay, great, but where are we going to get all these these uh, finance tokens? And they're like, okay, well, we've got this many of them. And, but, you know, the, the issue is, is that like, well, okay, what, for, first of all, like, um, how are we going to create markets that are connected to just this Binance token? And then how do we connect to those markets that are not yet connected to those Binance tokens? And, and it comes, I mean, the same with the Bitcoin guys. They'll say, hey, you know, we're the biggest uh, blockchain used in the entire world and, you know, Bitcoin's everywhere. Um, and you get into these problems of just saying, well, look, um, how is this village in Kenya going to get your Bitcoins? And, you know, in a way we've sort of just said, well, let's let these village in Kenya just create their own tokens and they can attach it to any reserve they want to. Now, if they happen to have Bitcoin or Binance tokens or something that's fiat exchangeable, great. If they don't, well, they can still have a virtual reserve that uh, is, is perfectly useful. It just means that they're not going to be able to exchange that virtual reserve necessarily with other communities unless they build enough a big enough community around that virtual reserve that that gives the virtual reserve value and that's exactly kind of what bnt was you know in a way that's you know so bank created their own version of this and they said okay everyone buy our reserve token as bnt and now they've they've created a stable uh, version of that uh, i think it's usdb um and and basically that was sort of the idea is like we're going to create a network of of currencies that connect to us as a reserve, and that gives us value. And that was their whole profit model, in a way, was to say, "Well, let's 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 um, basically make a profit or, or stay in business and pay for our costs by by uh, pr promoting the value of BNT as this network token." Well, you know, a village in or, you know twenty villages in Kenya could do the same exact thing, and it's just as valuable to them locally um, as it is for for Bancor in Israel. Um, and so that's I, that's this really interesting space of of saying, you know, uh, people need credit systems like right now. We need to employ millions of people to do the farming to feed the entire country in the next you know few months, for instance. Um, you know, how do we how do we do those things? How do we build these systems? I know a lot of people advocate for like a hundred percent reserve and things like that. It's just well, we just don't have that much money. I mean, practically right now to do that, like we can't just go in there and drop, you know, U.S. dollars or whatever they are on all these uh, people who need a medium of exchange. Um, so that's where we are right now. I think it's a it's super it's a super scary but super exciting time. Um, our, we've got a phone staff here in Kenya um, and some field staff as well, but they are working twenty four hours just managing phone calls, like people, you know, resetting their pins and. Things like doing transaction reversals and stuff like that, um, and then going and knitting together their communities. I, you know, especially during crisis, like the most valuable thing you probably have is your community. Um, and so it's nice to see that this is another way to identify community. I, I think we need lots of ways to identify community, and and um, I think this is a can be a very positive way to be part of a community to have this sort of shared credit space, um, and. 
you know, learnings from the last, you know, 10, 20 years of this type of currency development, like mutual credit, is that it's good to de-risk that, right? It's good to have some sort of common reserve. So one, you can connect to other community currencies and have a, an automated value system, an automated pricing system between those currencies. Two, it's good to have some sort of backer of last resort and at least being able to point to that collateral on chain right, is much better than any bank in Kenya, right? Because they can't really, they can't point to their their reserve on, on chain. They can't point to their reserve at all. Like if you audit a company or a, a bank in, in almost anywhere in the world, like it is a nightmare to try to understand what's behind the credit they're issuing. So if you were to do it this way, you would say like Wells Fargo can issue a Wells Fargo bucks. And those, those Wells Fargo bucks could be equal to a dollar as long as they maintain this reserve value. And if that's transparent on the blockchain, we could have a very... Um, you know, a much more robust and secure financial system, right? Instead of this sort of like, we're just going to mint as much money as we want without any backing. So like everyone's trying to make their own Bitcoin basically constantly all the time. And we get this hugely inflationary markets. And, and you know, if, if this collapse didn't happen because of coronavirus, I, you know, I guess all of our lives we've been hearing people warning us of imminent collapse. And, uh, and so it's, there's this kind of question of like, how do we build credit systems? How do we, you know, move forward in a transparent, honest way? And, and then, you know, and why wouldn't we do this stuff? And usually that's just because we want to hide the source of our, our, our credit. Like, or we want like Bitcoin, we want the value to go up 16,000%, right? And we want the first five people to have mint them to be rich by the end of that, right? Like what's the reason not to have some sort of on-chain collateral that you can point to and I, I, this is a very complex space, and I, I'm not I'm not trying to diss anybody, but it's just, um, yeah, I, I think it's time to wear 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 grown up pants and in this world of uh, credit creation and token creation, especially when right now anyone can quite easily make their own tokens. Yeah. All that. right, wonderful. We we'll, we we'll, we've we'll had the conversations uh, in the morning about. Uh, how does one identify with a community? And um, I think your talk fits in very well. Um, thank you so much. Uh, we've had a couple of questions in the chat, but someone also raised a hand here in the interactive space. So I would like to reward that and uh, give the mic to the fellow spacer. <clears throat> Hi. Hi. I've been uh, been living in Nigeria for 20 years, so I can uh, understand uh, a bit of what you're um, going through. So uh, one question I have is, uh, uh, okay, with uh, mobile phones, it's uh, quite, uh, it's, the technology is uh, disseminated, it's quite easy for, for the people to use them. Uh, the question is, uh, in, in what way do people now, now interact with the, with the blockchain? I mean, I understand your concern, and uh, really I'm uh, with you, but, I don't. I, uh, I I I find it kind of difficult to imagine how these people interact with the blockchain. Yeah. Okay. Through, I mean. Yeah. Okay. So basically, we've got a server sitting there on the at the telecom, right? That's connected. There's an API to the to the telecom, um, and they, every telecom in the world has these APIs, and, and usually it's called USSD, which is unstructured supplementary service data. It's like a layer under SMS. And basically, uh, if you dial this little like a short code, so we put these up in like shops everywhere. It's, I'm sure it's backwards for you here, but like there's a short code here. So if you dial this like star thing, uh, you get this. You get a little menu that pops up on your screen. Any phone, right? And then and then we're just we're just you know. So we've created this little menu for them, and based on that menu and their and their password, um, we basically push those transactions to the blockchain on their behalf right now. Okay. And as people are using smartphones. They could just access the same thing on MetaMask, right? We don't have, we actually don't have any web interface or wallet that they're using right now yet. So that's actually a big thing that we're missing. But we, it, it should be really easy to make that. I think anyone could basically, I mean, you could use MetaMask. Yeah, it's an analog wallet. Yeah, it's just a little analog wallet that great, everyone can great. just use right now. Yeah, exactly. Um, great. Look, yeah. Uh, this, this system is uh, quite interesting, what you said, yeah? So uh, please try and document this in a in, in, in a piece of paper with a, with a picture and uh, you know just make a picture of that and it's an interesting way of uh, yeah, this is uh, this interface with the blockchain yeah 
it's, it's very interesting because uh, it makes uh, people yeah. uh, visualize blockchain. Otherwise, blockchain is uh, just an abstract uh, idea. Sure. Yeah. Anyway, we've got a few. I, I'll, we'll share some links maybe later. Uh, there's a white paper and some of that stuff. So, okay. and that, uh, you're right. We need a lot more documentation, and that, that's been a. It's just you know, there. It's like literally a handful of people. You know, that's it. Uh, volunteers doing this stuff. So that's the that's probably our main one of our main issues is just you know, it'd be nice to have like one full time programmer. You know. Okay. Yeah. Good. Great job. Yeah, documentation Cheers, is always yeah. difficult, especially yeah. because everyone's uh, everything's changing so fast. Yeah. Um, all right. So I see Grace has asked a question in the channel, but she has also raised a hand. So Grace, if you if you'd like to speak, that would be even better. Sure. I saw you were rewarding people for raising their hands. So <laughs> I, I, I followed the direction. <laughs> so my question is about. Um, you know, I've heard people say that as they're when they're doing these programs in these locations, the more that they're integrating more and more communities, the more it draws the wrong kind of attention from authorities. So how big does this have to get before it draws the wrong kind of attention? And then how big does it have to get before you can't stop it? And maybe if it's connected to the telecom, it could always be stopped. So that's my question. Yeah, no, I totally agree. I, you know, we've we've been sort of waiting for everyone to have a smartphone and get internet access for a long time. Um, and I think a lot of the world right now has enough internet access, and there are places that have like even here, like they're pushing like mesh networks, and that's getting really big in like South Africa and stuff like that too. So bringing internet out to people is still um, the way forward. I, I think that uh, this is just a stopgap. You know, I ideally. In a in a more perfect world, we wouldn't have to have any sort of managed systems like this at all because we're sort of centralized in a way that I would prefer us not to be, right? Like, you know, ideally they would hold their own uh, private keys and all that kind of stuff, right? Um, and uh, I think for most of the world, like with smartphones and whatnot, you guys can do these things. Um, I mean, there there's some ideas around the technology of of uh, you know, I, I, telecoms might still be around for quite some time and we might still have you know billions of people sort of dependent on telecoms you know more still more than the internet so it's just yeah it's just a stopgap right now and i think your your question in terms of you know authorities and whatnot is uh, i you know when they when they took us to jail for doing this stuff back in 2013 it was just I mean, everyone was sort of scared. They were just, you know, they could just kick us, kick us out of the country, or you know, uh, or at least me. I'm, I'm the only. Uh, I, I was originally from the U.S. and I've been here for like 12 years, and I have a family here and everything. But uh, still, like that was the fear: is they're going to like, you know, kick me out of the country or something like this. And uh, but uh, in the end, it was a total embarrassment to them, right? So the media came in and said, you know, these people are. They're, we're not taking any money from people. We're not. Uh, um, you know, it's a nonprofit, you know, like there's nothing, it, you're helping women pay school fees with tomatoes, basically, right? We're creating these little barter networks and these are in the most populated slums in Kenya where the government's not really helping them at all, you know? And so, you know, it, it became a public very, and so I would, you know, it, if you're going to go down that route, I would say, make it as good for people as possible. Don't take any profit off of it. And let them take you to jail for that, please. You know, have some have some you know guts and and do something good for people. And you know, if that's illegal, then great, great because it it, it that will spread awareness and try to make that as public as possible, right? It was it was definitely in our benefit that the media was around in those things and that you know here here were all these people that were using the system to to send their kids for daycare and stuff like this, right? And it was the the local police that were trying to they were catching people cross tracks and make them pay big bribes or they take like 12 year olds into the jail for a week so their parents have to bring them out of jail just for crossing a railroad track and so the parents were trying to pay with these currencies and that's when they alerted the authorities and said oh you know these guys are doing you know so it was just you know it was, it, it, if you can expose that type of corruption in the first place and make it public i mean in the end the government came and started helping that community they built them a road. I mean, it was really embarrassing. So I think that was that was a really positive positive thing. Um, and in regulation today, I mean, so that court case, we went all the way through to the attorney general. We did petitions, and um, 
uh, they basically said there's no law being broken. It would, and in order to make this illegal, they would have had to make a lot of other things illegal as well in Kenya, like any kind of like voucher system. Like it was really hard for them to sort of, why would this be illegal exactly? You know, and, and what regulation does it fit into? And, and I, you know, I think becoming regulated and in fact, you know, um, making sort of a fool of the current banking regulations, which are horrible. They, they're almost nothing actually, right? And so we're way more regulated than them because we have transparent contracts on the blockchain that you can audit and you can look at, you know, this is the collateral behind it. Here's the reserve, you know, what, you know, that it's way more regulated than a bank in, in a sense, you know what I mean? Like it's self-regulated. So I think really pushing that and with Red Cross, it's just, a, you know, phrasing this as an aid voucher, um, it's a no brainer, right? So you just, it's so a wait, we're, okay, so we're going out and giving aid vouchers because we don't have enough cash to give all these people. They're able to trade with each other, right? And Red Cross helps seed the backing for them. So some, there is some cashing out behind it. Um, I think that's, you know, that's the way to really make these things push forward as fast as possible to help the current situation in a way that, um, you know, if, if you know, everything, the, the entire, you know, a neoliberal economy gets back on its feet, you know, in, in some sort of Elysium, you know, state system in the next few years, and they decide to outlaw these things. Well, hopefully by that time, they're so widespread and, and people can use them on smartphones. So even if the, you know, I mean, there's still a smartphone for almost, you know, every other house in Kenya, almost right now. And so you could still have a credit system like that. In fact, the old credit systems were like a guy with a piece of paper that everyone went to that guy and said, you know, so, I mean, you, you know, a, a smartphone in almost every other house is, is close enough anyways. So. Yeah. Cheers. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you. We've um, had another question in the chat. Um, how is the exchange rate defined? Do, do you already address this? If not, could you maybe explain? Yeah. I think I, you know, it's really good to look at the the Bancor protocol white paper is, is a nice one. Also, I've got a bunch of videos. If you look up Village Market Simulator, I, I write a lot of little simulations for this stuff that are visual, so they're kind of fun. Um, and it goes through some of those the equations. But basically, the, the basic pricing system is just to say your price is equal to L, your leverage, times your reserve divided by your supply. So your reserve would be whatever you're backing it with, and that could be a virtual token, it, it could be XDAI or anything like that, and your supply is your, your credit supply. So that's that's what we're issuing. That's the um, uh, CICs for Red Cross, the community inclusion currencies, and whatnot. So that's, that's it, that's our pricing system. Now, the bonding curve basically says that as I burn supply, get rid of it, and I pull out reserve, how much reserve do I get depending on the levels of leverage depending on the levels of reserve and supply that exist there and vice versa if i'm adding more reserve how many tokens do i mint and so that that those equations are really interesting to look at and that's what we're looking a lot with uh, block science right now all right thank you um there's another question from shebnam uh, she's asking how do you uh, identify or reach out to the communities did you find a way that scales or are you still crucial to advocating accessible um, CICs? Yeah, so, I mean, what we've done in the past was we would go in through the chief and elders and youth groups and the chamas, these savings groups. Um, and it's usually just people referring us to other areas. And there, there's a referral program. So like basically if you enroll somebody else into the system, you get some tokens for that. There's a, there's a lot of incentive building in terms of centrality. So if you're a central if you're if you're trading with a lot of unique people uh, above a certain level, you get more of a of a even a weekly boost or even a daily boost into your account. So there's a lot of sort of distribution that way, and so that creates a lot of virality of it spreading. So I mean, right now we're spreading at anywhere from twenty to a hundred people a day right now, um, and and that's still very slow. So I mean, you know, we've gone up I think four five hundred percent enrollment in the, in just this year. Um, sorry, no, so for the last year, um, since since 2019. Um, but uh, to make it really viral, um, I think that uh, th this whole work with Red Cross is really exciting because they've got something like 1.5 million employees and, you know, they're all franchised around the world. But, you know, if this is an effective me method to help communities 
build their local resilience and support each other right now, um, I think it's something that, that you know, could be rolled out, um, you know, a lot, at least, you know, if not now, then, you know, the coming six months to a year um, all over the place. Um, you know, a lot of the limitations, like, you know, we've mentioned of like um, connecting it to mobile phones, but if, if there was a, you know, a, a, a smartphone based version of this, I think it would be quite easy for people to just adopt and use everywhere. Um, and, and by this, I mean, you've got some blockchain that you're using. I mean, you know, what we're using right now with Red Cross is XDAI uh, as a blockchain. It's the POA family of blockchains is basically just ERC-20. It's, it's, it's you know, a, a sidechain off Ethereum. And, uh, and essentially, it's deploying some contracts, which anybody can do, right? You're just deploying these, this converter. You're adding some collateral to it, and you're minting your supply. Now... I have got a MOOC you guys can maybe check out on the website. That's it's old now, but it was a MOOC around creating paper currencies. And so, you know, I, uh, one of my friends, Griff likes to always say that, um, you know, you don't want to give people bazookas without training them how to use them sort of thing. So, and I'd like to think these are not bazookas, but they, you know, they're definitely, you know, serious instruments. And, and so building a community around these things and, uh, you know, ensuring that there is that local backing and that, that all that's behind them. And there's Griff. Hey man. <laughs> um, yeah, making sure that, you know, that, that local commitment and backing is there. And so that this, you know, this reserve piece is a collateral piece. It's not the only piece, right? So if I'm creating 400 tokens and I only have a hundred die behind them, well, am I actually backing them with my goods and services? Is that the real backing? And then that the collateral behind that, or is it, you know, if, if I've got a million to one leverage on this, and nobody knows that, and I've created a million tokens, and I've only got a dollar behind it, and then I tell everyone this is worth a dollar, right? So there's those kinds of standards and, and training that really needs to people need to understand as well. And we need, you know, a, a, the ability to audit these these contracts is also super important. Yeah. Well, well, first of all, amazing success rate on the inclusion for one year. That's that's amazing. Yeah. yeah thanks, guys. Yeah. Congrats. Yeah, sure. Wow. Yeah. Um, yeah, Griff is actually our next speaker. Um, thank you, Will, so much for taking the time. Your uh, presentation was very interesting. Thank you. Um, we will maybe make a very short break. You can continue all the conversations and discussions in another channel. So the link is more or less the same, thus instead of Crypto Economics minus Lab, uh, type uh, Crypto Economics minus Hangout. And if Will has uh, some time, maybe you can continue the conversations there or otherwise just with a, uh, your fellow spacers. Um, thank you. And uh, Griff, let's maybe check your screen sharing because we've had some issues with it. Thank you, Will, so much. Sure. Okay, cheers. Uh, and while we're checking my screen share, let me just say Grassroots Economics is the coolest project in the world. Hands down is the most important project. This is the most important crypto project out there. And they have a Gitcoin campaign right now where if you one die, they will get, hold your horses, 230 die for one. Whoa. Yes, exactly. Yeah, I didn't know that was true, that's cool. It's, they, they yeah. actually have two amazing yeah. Gitcoin grants. Uh, do you want to talk about your Gitcoin grant really quick, Will, while I check? Well, I, I think, I, you know, what's cool about this concept in a way is, it, you know, the, by attaching it to XDAI, it means that mm -hmm. basically anyone in the world can basically invest, if you will, or, or support or, or stake money into local economies, right? So if Griff creates his, you know, community currency over there, and, and where are you, Barcelona now? Or no? Yeah. yeah. So... Obviously, there's got to be several of these in Barcelona, and and Griff is going to have you know his, and it's connected to this group of businesses and this community or something like this. And if you are basically putting money into the reserve of those, you're minting tokens. Like if you're Red Cross, you're donating those tokens also to the community, but also you could hold those. And and even as a community member, it it means that you're staked into that economy. And I think that's a really positive sort of. You know, it, it ties into this sort of proof of work kind of concept of just saying, well, the benefit, you know, like for you to do well with your investment into that economy means that that economy is more resilient. 